Good morning, church. Great to see you. Um, from time to time, and in some seasons more often than others, I get asked a very specific, specific question. Pastor, are we getting closer to the return of Christ? And of course, you watch the news and you even see uh, what's going on in Israel right now and, and the, the geopolitical, biblical connections to some of these things. And you're like, wow, I'm kind of keying in. I'm uh, looking and listening for perhaps the return of Christ. My answer is always the same when I get that answer. I mean, when I get that question and it's this, we're closer today than we were yesterday. Right? I mean, that, that, that is the go-to. Yeah, but, but what about the signs of the times? Are we in the last days? Hey, I would love Peter to answer that question for you. First Peter 4, verse 7 says this. First Peter 4, 7. The end of all things is what? It's at hand. It's close. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. He's saying, listen, the day Christ walked out of the tomb and then the Holy Spirit descended a little while later on the church of Jesus Christ, those that are saved in Pentecost, at that moment we are in the last days. And we are to be what? Self-controlled, sober-minded. We're not to be panicked. We're to be self-controlled. We're to be sober-minded. And we're to be sharing the good news of the gospel because these are the last days. Today's message will challenge, I hope, the church of Jesus Christ here, how we are to live in the last days. And then we're going to have a follow-up this Wednesday and the Wednesday following, um, just speaking on the doctrine of eschatology together as a church. Um, We're going to look at that with great humility. We're going to show all the different ways in which uh, the church today may look at eschatology and what we as Bible Baptist Church hold to and uh, how we see and understand those scriptures. And uh, we're excited to take that walk with you. I also wanted to mention that every five years, Our Constitution and bylaws states that we are to review our Constitution and our bylaws. And so every five years we've done that and we think that we've done that well and faithfully. Um, What we've done this year is we've created a team, a team of both uh, elders as well as different members of our congregation, men and women, uh, that have done good work with us and um, helping us uh, review the bylaws and the Constitution. And we wanted to highlight a few areas that we worked on. We wanted to make sure that it was clear. And so we went through the, the um, bylaws and we went through the Constitution and we say, is this readable? Is it clear? Does it make sense as we kind of work our way through it? Is it understandable? And then are we doing it? Is it functioning here at Bible Baptist Church? And so we were looking at these areas and where um, we needed to bring clarity, we brought clarity, and where we needed to maybe say, hey, here's a way that we will function going forward. It wasn't really explained. We kind of put that in there, or we don't do it this way, took it out. And what we did is we made sure that any changes were in red ink, because that's what you do. And uh, what was there before is in black ink, and we're going to slowly work our way with you, the congregation, through our constitution and bylaws and any of those changes and transitions, and we think that that will be really, really helpful for you. Um, When we hand out um, our constitution and bylaws, we also want it to bring unity. We want to have unity in our mission. And so we cycle our mission through our bylaws and through our constitution so that we understand what it is we're trying to accomplish. 
We want to have unity in our core values. And so we've done the same thing with our core values as we've looked at our doctrinal statement and as we looked at the way in which we do life and practice here as a church, we wanted to make sure that that was all wrapped in together and that it was very understandable. And then we also realized that we want that book to be able to help us in regards of membership as well as separation. So it says this is who we are as a church, not the church at large, but a local church and how we do faith and practice. These are the doctrines that we hold to at Bible Baptist. If you are going to become a member here, you need to hold on to these truths. And then we also understand that this is helping us say, here's how we are different, different from other churches in the world around us. And so we've done a good job, I think, as a team, working our way through these different things. Um, we want to make sure that, again, we are helping uh, our church and those that want to become a part of our church understand who we are and our DNA. And we think our constitution and bylaws does that. So we've been at work in that. Um, there was, however, something that I did want to point out because I think it's important for us to be fully transparent. There was, however, on the doctrine of last things, um, the leaders are proposing a slight rewording of the statement. Uh, and we didn't want to catch the congregation off guard or lack transparency, but rather explain that reasoning. In other words, give you the why and why it's being considered. And we think that it will bring better clarity in regards to membership and separation issues. And so what we're going to do is we're also going to video the class, especially the part that is going to deal with that. So you may say, ah, I wasn't going to take the class, but now I think I will take the class. And we would love for you to come and to enjoy that class with us as we unpack those things in the next two weeks. If you say, I can't make the class, like I said, we will have it videoed and you will be able to watch it as well as when we hand you the document, you'll be able to go through and see all the different changes that were made. Uh, we have not changed one thing that we believe in. <laughs> We believe exactly today as we did yesterday and the year before that and really as we began this church. So praise the Lord for that unity and that will continue. Um, but we do wanna make sure that what we state is clear and that what we say is helpful. And so we have made changes in some of those areas and we wanted you to be aware of them. Make sense? Capiche? Hey, let's get back to this uh, exciting message here today. Uh, I will tell you that that class is going to be helpful. It is not a prophecy conference. So if you're coming hoping, Pastor, are you going to tell us who is Gog and who is Magog? You know, is it Russia and is it China? I'm not going to dive into it that deep. Pastor, is Joe Biden the Antichrist, right? No, we're not going to go there. Pastor, what about the red heifer? Not going to be talked about unless you're having something like that for dinner. <laughs> but pastor, in all seriousness, there are wars and rumors of wars. There is a great amount of pestilence, and there are earthquakes, and there are situations that are happening in the world around us, geopolitically and otherwise, that the scriptures do make us step back and say, are we in what Jesus called the labor pains before the return of Christ? And I think that that is a fair conversation to have, and a church needs to be prepared and ready for that great day. And so we would say, absolutely. What does it all mean? I will tell you this, there are men that are much more gifted than I am in expositing prophecy and even receiving insights from the word in that way. And um, my goal today is not to dive into some of that area, but to keep the main thing the main thing. What is the main thing that we're to be prepared about? Acts 1, 6 and 7 says this, talking about Jesus and he's getting ready to go up into heaven and leave this earth. And his disciples are anxious as it's the first time that they will be without their savior 
to guide them, to direct them, to lead them. And so it says, so when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? In other words, Lord, tell us, tell us how all of this is going to unfold. Tell us exactly how all of the end times are going to work out and when you're going to establish your kingdom and when you're going to bring God's kingdom to earth. We want to know. Give us the charts, right? Give us the the eschatological understanding so that we're prepared. And he said to them, what? It is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. He's saying, listen, this is not what I'm here to give you. There's going to be some ambiguity to this, but I'm going to make what I want you to do very, very, very plain. I want you to take the gospel to your own town, Jerusalem. And then I want you to take it to Judea. Then I want you to take it to Samaria. And then I want it to go to the ends of the earth. That's what you're to be doing. And I will come back. But until then, be busy about what it is that is the main thing that I want you to be busy about. Get the gospel out to the whole earth. That is our motivation. Jesus talked to his disciples in Matthew 24, and he warned them about the last days. And he said, in the last days, there will be wars and rumors of wars, but in every age of history, there are what? Wars and rumors of wars. The fact of the matter is, after the fall, we are a warring people. You might want to go into the nursery, (laughs) right? I mean, it it is just a part of who we are. And so in one sense, there are always going to be wars that the church of Jesus Christ has to bring comfort and direction through and in to the world around us. There are always going to be antichrist. Who is the antichrist? I don't know. But there is always going to be those opposed to the word of God that have power. And they're always going to bring the doctrine of Satan to this world. And we're to oppose them in whatever age and whatever season we are the church of Jesus Christ. And you might say, but pastor, it's your job to know this. It is not. My job is not to know all of this stuff. My job is to make him known. And your job is to want to know him and to make him known. That's what we are here to do. And that is not belittling anyone who says, but I really love prophecy, good. That's not your major job. It's not belittling anyone who has spent their life on eschatology and the theology of that and understanding prophecy, very helpful, but it's not the church's main job. Listen, the apostle John did not give us the revelation for the church to create apocalyptic roadmaps of the end times and then divide from one another. It's not why he gave us revelation. As a matter of fact, revelation is to cause the church to come together and worship. And the whole end of the book is this, that all believers are together around the throne of God singing in unison the great glory of the King of kings and Lord of lords who came and triumphantly brought victory to this world in the new heavens and new earth. Yes, that means that around that throne room, pre-tribbers are going to be sitting next to Individuals that don't see it exactly the way we do. And we show grace. Today, understanding the reality of tomorrow. If Jesus is okay with ambiguity on this hot topic of the return of the Lord, I think we should be also. 
As a matter of fact, Matthew 24, verse 36 says this. The disciples again are asking a question, but what about the day or hour that you're going to come back, Jesus? Tell us the day. Tell us the hour of your return. We want to know. We need to know. And Jesus leaned in and he said, only Hal Lindsey knows. Only Jack Van Impey knows. Only John Hagee can explain it to you. No, that's not what he said. He said this, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven, not the sun. In other words, I do not know, and I am deity, and I'm okay with it. You should be. Only the Father knows. I'll tell you what, the Apostle Paul does do something for the church. He warns the church what it will look like in the last days. And I do think that that is something that should be very interesting to us. How all the eschatological charts are going to work out and the exact day that Jesus is going to come and, and is it going to be in this year because this happened in the Jewish calendar and we did some math and we tried to figure it out. And we say, I think it's in this season that he's going to stop. What's the church supposed to look like in the last days? That's important. So what is it? Second Timothy shares this with us. Let's look at what it says. It says, but understand this, that in the last days, there will come times of difficulty for people who will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power, avoiding such people, for among them are those who creep into the household and capture weak women burdened with sin and led astray in various passions." always learning and never able to arrive at a knowledge of the truth. Just as James and Jambres opposed Moses, so those men also opposed the truth, men corrupted in mind and disqualified regarding the faith. But they will not get very far, for their folly will be plain to all, as was that of those two men. He's saying, listen, in the last days, the church is going to look different. There will be times of difficulty. It will be hard. It will be scary for the church. They're gonna feel alone. They're gonna feel not connected to society. They're gonna feel separated from the culture and the people that love that culture. And they're gonna do one of two things. He said, people will be lovers of their own self. Are we a self-love world right now? Are we a self-love culture right now? I don't even think that they could believe the fact. That sociologists say this, that we are by far the most narcissistic culture that ever existed. And you say, really, are you sure? Listen, seriously, we think it's normal for every person to have a page just about them. We, we think like that's normal. I, everyone wants to know what I'm doing, where I'm on vacation, and what I'm having for dinner, how my love life is. Why? Oh, man, we love ourselves, don't we? Whitney Houston, whenever I think about loving myself, I think of a Whitney Houston song, the greatest love of all is to love yourself. You be you, be true to yourself. First and foremost, you are top. Let no one talk 
to you in any way that you don't want them to or tell you that you are anything that you don't want to be. Self-love rules, man. Paul says in the end times, the world is going to go crazy with self-love and self-expression. And sadly, the church will buy into it. You can go to a lot of good Christian conferences and you know what the whole topic of the conference is going to be? You need to learn how to love yourself before you can love the world around you. Can I tell you what the two greatest commandments are? That's not part of it, by the way. L let me tell you what the two greatest commandments are. Love the Lord your God. He rules. He decides who you are. He decides where you should go. He decides what your next step is. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength, with all your might. Then what? Now it's time to love me, right? Oh, not so fast. Love your neighbor more than you love yourself. Man, have we quickly forgotten that as a society, and sadly, has the church quickly forgotten that? In a victimized, self-loving world. Loving yourself is the sewage pipe of all those other vices that we read about. The love of money. Why do you love money? Because you love you, <laughs> right? Why are you proud, arrogant, abusive, ungrateful, unholy, looking just like the world, not wanting to be separate from it? Why are you heartless? Why are you unappeasable? Why are you slanderous? Without self-control, why do you act brutally towards others, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit and pride? He gave a, a, a not-so-flattering list of the future church. Then he said that children will be disobedient to their parents. And yes, he's certainly talking about behavior. You're going to see a change in behavior and respect that children have for their parents. Do you know that the gospel is always one generation away from extinction within the context of that culture? God's design was that moms and dads pass the baton of faith and wisdom and righteousness down to the next generation. Here's what God has taught us. We are passing this down to the next generation. The challenge is this. Satan says, whatever God designs, I'm going to counterfeit and I'm going to corrupt it. Whatever God ordains, I'm going to undermine it. And so Satan is the father of lies, and his primary weapon is not artillery, but I, it, it's ideology. And in Matthew 10, Jesus said, in the last days, he will turn the heart of the children against fathers and against mothers. So in our culture today, there are two things that Satan is using to stop God's design of parents passing their values down to their children. And you're saying, what are those things? Technology and ideology. You say, are we going to dive into that in this sermon? No, we don't have time to do that. Come Mother's Day. And we're going to look through these different discussions. But I can tell you this, this is the first generation in human history to believe and be taught that a younger generation is smarter and wiser than the previous generation. And we're not better off for it. We want righteousness to be passed down. And would God help us do that well as a church? We are lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Do you not even see that in a lot of the methodology of the Church of Jesus Christ today? Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And you say, what do you mean? Well, the church is trying to draw people in through pleasure. 
We literally have a health and wealth gospel that says, come to our church and everything will get better. Come to our church and everything will get easier. Accept Jesus and you'll get the money you want. Accept Jesus and all your relationships will work out. Accept Jesus and that you will be healed. You will be healed from your diseases. Why are we teaching these things? Oh, because we love pleasure and we don't want to tell someone, come to Jesus, come and die to yourself so that you can live for God and his purposes. Come to Jesus and the rest of the world will probably turn against you and it's not going to be super, super easy doing it, but we are called to do that and one day he will come again and we will be ushered into the kingdom of God. Listen, it is reasonable for the world to be tumultuous, to be lovers of pleasure, to be all of these things that we read. And I'm not so concerned about the world right now. The world's like the ocean. It's going all over the place. The church is the boat. And what I'm looking at is the boat. How are we doing? Not, not concerned so much about what they're doing. I'm concerned about how are we doing as the church in the last days. I don't want it to look anything like that description, gang. I don't want it to look anything like that. I want to be a stark difference for the world to see. And I am going to pay less attention to them and more attention to us and to me personally. I have a very, very sincere question to ask you this morning. Are you personally, deeply in love with Jesus right now? Are you a lover of self? A lover of pleasure? A lover of your way? God, I am willing to go against the flow because I love you more than I love myself. I love you more than I love money. I love you more than I love pleasure. I think a lot of times we don't understand how it is that we are to be obedient as the church in Jesus Christ. So let's make it pretty simple for you here this morning. Have you ever played the game Simon Says? Simon says, and then what are you to do? What Simon says, right? It's really clear. Now, if we go into the church of Jesus Christ today and we play the game Jesus says, Jesus says, here's what you'll get. A definition of what Jesus says. Let's just say my parents say, Brian, clean your room. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to say, okay, Dad, I'm going to go home and memorize what you just said. Clean your room, clean your room, clean your room. A couple days later, I'll come back in. Dad, guess what? Clean your room. Good boy, son. You did great. Dad, I can say clean your room in the Greek. Wow. That's amazing. Right? But did you clean your room? What are we doing, church? Oh, this is what the Bible says. I've memorized it. Okay. I, I, I've checked all the Greek. Strong's Concordance. I know it backward and forward. Great. Are you doing it? Are you following it? Yeah, but you see, I'm, I'm a lover of pleasure and it's not going to lead to that. You see, I, I want to sit on the throne of my life and it's not going to allow me to do that. So I want to go and study it in my small group, group for five weeks as opposed to change. Listen, the message of the church must be we follow Jesus. And why do we follow Jesus? 
because we get Jesus and he's enough. It says in the last days, people will not endure sound teaching. It says that they will have itchy ears, desire to hear what they want someone to tell them. And so they'll go to church, to church, to church, to church, so that they can do whatever it is that they want to do. There will come a time, Timothy is saying, I mean, Paul is saying to Timothy, listen, Timothy, you're a pastor. And there's going to come a day when the church doesn't want to hear this book any longer. There's coming a sad day in the last days where the church doesn't want to hear what this book has to say. They will find a teacher to tell them what they want to hear as opposed to what this book says. Listen, we are in that day, gang. If you want to get divorced, I can find a church and a counselor in that church with a PhD to tell you that it's fine. If you want to have sex outside of marriage, I can find a pastor with a PhD that'll tell you it's okay in your situation. You want to talk about your greed and how you're really not able to give to see the gospel spread to the end of the earth? I can find somebody that'll tell you it is fine for you to spend the way that you want to spend and you do not have to think about your finances whatsoever. If you want to abort your child, I can find a church to tell you that that makes good fiscal sense for your family and situation right now. You want to marry the same sex? There's someone with a PhD that'll tell you the Bible has nothing to say about that and that you should follow through. Sin, repentance, hell, not necessary to talk about. What's your pleasure, church? What do you want the Bible to say? There's a teacher that'll collaborate it for you. Paul says, Timothy, don't be that pastor. Church, don't be that church. Preach the word in season. That means when it's easy and when it's popular and preach the word out of season, Timothy, when it's not easy and it's not popular. This is the way the world's going to get, Timothy. But as for you, this is the way the world is going to get, Bible Baptist Church. But as for you, this is the way the world is going to get, Brian. But as for you, be faithful. And what the word says do. First Peter 4, 7. Can we put that back up on the screen? It's the very first verse we looked at. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled, be sober-minded for the sake of your what? Man, we need to be praying. If we are in the end times, we need to be praying more. If we're in the end times, we need to be praying for each other. If we're in the end times, we need to be prepared for an onslaught of the evil one on the church. A humble desperation. Let's um, look at 2 Peter 
chapter 3 together. Go ahead and turn your Bible to 2 Peter chapter 3. This is the second letter, and Peter here is describing the day of the Lord and just preparing the church for that coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So 2 Peter chapter 3 says this, This is now the second letter that I am writing to you, beloved. In both of them, I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophet and the commandments of the Lord and Savior through your apostles. Know this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. And they will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. For they deliberated, deliberately overlooked this fact, that the heaven existed long ago and the earth was formed out of the water through the water by the word of God. And that by means of these, the word that, wa- that has existed was deluged with water and perished. But by the same word they have on earth now existed and stored up for fire being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is a thousand years, and a thousand years one day. And the Lord is not slow to his faithful, to the faithful promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night when the heavens shall pass away and the roar of the heavens and bodies will be burned up and dissolved and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed since all these things are thus to be dissolved. What sort of people ought you to be and what lives of, you should have lives of holiness and godliness waiting for the hastening and the coming day of God because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolve and the heaven bodies will melt as they burn. But according to his promise, we are all waiting for the new heavens and a new earth in which the righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. And count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given to him. He is saying the end is near. Therefore, be sober-minded. Pray together. Be in humble desperation for the Lord. And you might say, wait a second, near? It's been 2,000 years since Peter said this. How, how is this near, Peter? Your definition of near is a lot different than my definition of near. Like, I would hate for you to be my parent. How far are we? We're close. 2,000 miles away. We are 2,000 years apart from Peter writing this passage of Scripture, from Peter saying that the return of Christ is near. How are we supposed to take the Bible seriously then? Well, in 2 Peter 3, we get that answer when he talks about the day of the Lord, right? And we realize that he's speaking now 30 years after the resurrection of Christ, and he's getting challenged in that same way. Peter, you're saying that we're in the last days and that Christ is going to return. It's been 30 years. We don't see him. And he's saying, you don't understand the heart of our God and that he is outside of time, and he doesn't work in the same way that we work. And so, what does he say? He basically is encouraging them that they are to have patience, live with patience in the last days, 
Scoffers will come in the last days. Scoffers are going to scoff, right? The end times is different in God's viewpoint. And so he gives us this idea that one day is like a thousand years. And so all of history in God's metaphor of time has been two days. And we right now, church, are in the third day of eschatological math. Now, I have some good news. Cool stuff tends to happen on day three, right? Amen. When we can hope and pray, come, Lord Jesus, Maranatha, right? Come quickly. But we're only in the third day. 2024 20, will last just 86.4 seconds. The world is going to be, what does he say? Destroyed. God's judgment is coming again to the earth. People will scoff and say, no, 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 no. This earth is my religion. And he says, this destruction won't come like the first one in Noah's day when the scoffers came and made fun of him. And we said, the judgment of God is coming. The return of God is coming. And they're saying, no, 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 no. And they were judged by water. This time it's going to be judgment by fire. Everything that we have built over these 2,000 years will burn. Everything that we have achieved, patted ourselves on the back on, it's going to dissolve, it says. Now, we are to be good stewards of this earth. God gave us that responsibility. He said, I am giving you this beautiful place. Take care of it. Stored it well. But it is not to be our religion because at the end, this earth will burn and there will be a new heaven and new earth. Two types of people. In the last days, there will be people that ignore all the signs, that will sit there and say, ah, it's been so long I don't need to worry about it. I don't need to think about it. It's never going to happen. And then there's the obsessed, right? They're looking at their watch instead of redeeming the time. They're all worried about when instead of what it is I'm supposed to do. And we don't want to be either one of those. What are we to be? We're to be patient. We are to be waiting expectantly with God for his sovereign purposes and plans to take place, to be revealed, to be rolled out. But I, but I want to get my levers on the, on the controls of God's sovereignty. God, you should come now. God, you should handle this this way. And God's like, I got this. I'm in control. And I am going to come. And I am going to establish the new kingdom but it's going to be when I want it to happen, how I want it to happen, and you will be patient. But it's been 2,000 years, and it might be 2,000 more, or it might be tomorrow. I know you'll look around and you'll say, but pastor, I'm sickened by what I see. Don't you think a holy God is sickened by what he sees? His creation shaking their fist at him and saying, we will do what we want to do. We will be what we want to be. But also this passage shows the heart of God, the patience of God, the grace of God. It is beyond human comprehension. He's saying, listen, I still have lost children that are gonna find me and know me. I still have children that I want to adopt into my family. I must get them. 
Listen, it might be one of your coworkers. It might be your neighbor. It might be a family member, a people group that he's going to see rise up and come to Christ. 3.8 says that the Lord is not willing that any should perish. What is the moral will of God? God's will is that no one would be under the judgment and wrath of God. God, give me your loving and patient heart for the world. But not only are we to be patient, we're also to be urgent. Verse 11 tells us, right? How how can we be patient and urgent at the same time? Patience, God, you don't have to connect all my eschatological dots. I will instead, just in faith, trust you. Jesus will return. Look, I can tell you this, no one, when you see Jesus, are going to hear this, well done. You've got the right chart. It's gonna be well done, thou good and faithful servant. What did you do in service? I delivered the good news. I lived differently than the world so they could see Christ in me. Well done. He says that we are waiting and hastening the coming of God. So what does that mean? It means that our actions play a role in the fulfillment of his purposes. So our work on earth, God is going to use to accomplish his sanctified purposes. He's going to use us in that amazing way. Matthew 24, 14 puts it this way. And the gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. So God says this to all of us, go to the end of the world with the gospel. We are going to faithfully do our best to do that and accomplish that, and then the end will come. (laughs) So we are being used by God in his purposes, in his sovereign work. Pastor, I believe that Jesus is coming soon. Me too, absolutely. Let's urgently share the good news. We have coming up a great opportunity to do that this summer with the 150th anniversary of Shirenstown. An opportunity for us to be good neighbors an opportunity for us to share the good news because he is not willing that any should perish and all should come to repentance. We're gonna have an an apologetics evangelism conference, not a prophecy conference, but a conference to make you a better disciple and a better evangelist. Why? So we can be used by God to bring about the end. We're gonna have a who's your one Sunday and give you an opportunity to invite someone that you've been praying for and working on, seeing their eyes opened to the light of the gospel. If these are the last days, everyone in Shireman's Town must hear the good news. Everyone at your workplace must hear the good news. Everyone in your family must hear the good news. He's coming. Everyone at your school must hear the good news. Ephesians 5, 14 through 15 says that we are to be light to those that are in darkness, that can't see that darkness. And then it says this quote from Isaiah 60, awake, O sleeper, arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. 
Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Listen to me. Some of you students, your roommate is asleep, spiritually speaking. They're not awake, and Christ is coming. The person at your workplace is asleep. They're not awake, and Christ is coming. Your neighbor is asleep. And the only thing keeping God from returning today is the souls that do not know him. It's just simply grace. And the only job that we really, really ultimately have as the church of Jesus Christ is to take this good news and this beautiful message to those that are asleep and say like an alarm clock, wake up, wake up, wake up world. There is an almighty, there is a king of kings and Lord of lords and he is returning. And it might be, it could be today. And if it's not, it's simply because he's so gracious, he wants you to wake up before he comes back. The fields are white. The time is short. I'm urgent. We don't have time to get off on different squabbles, to worry about who offended you, who did what, where, when, how. My personal feeling, my this, my that. The elders did this, the pastor did that. Hey, he's coming back. We need to get our house looking up because our redemption draweth nigh. And we need to be awaiting his return, not twiddling our thumbs, but actively spreading the good news. And when he comes, may he find us faithful, faithful as individuals and faithful as the church. We need to be an urgent church. Come on, church, let's keep the main thing the main thing. as we move forward with the Lord. He says also that there is a great hope for us, a great hope. I saw in a magazine the other day, a hundred places to see before you die. Now, here's the problem with that in an achiever personality. I read that article and I said, I have to get to all 100 of these places before I die. And I'm not gonna make it. As a matter of fact, if I get to five, I'm really, really living the dream. But I will tell you this, I have a hope, and that hope is a certainty that the ultimate place to be the kingdom of God, we will see. We will be together and we will see him face to face. May he come quickly and may he find us faithful. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the promise of your return. God, there is so much in our own self and in this age to distract us. And I just pray that this conversation just kind of crystallizes what it is that we're focused on and what it is you want your church to be. Lord, use us to be your voice. Lord, allow us 
to have your heart, your heart for the lost, your heart for righteousness, your heart for the church and the purity of it. And Lord, we await your return with great anticipation. In Jesus' precious and holy name we pray, amen.